Well, welcome, good morning, everyone. This is a really special, special day, and so we we're gonna have uh, some introductions going on. It is the Young T. Uh, Yam uh, Memorial Lectureship, and his wife is here, and also prior researchers that work with him. So I'm gonna let uh, Dr. Tony Yankala come up and introduce the Memorial Lectureship for the first thing. Come on up. Thank you, Dr. Kruger. That was a very good Finnish pronunciation. Oh, good. Excellent. <laughs> Jankila. Everyone just calls me Tony because of the last name. <clears throat> yeah, it's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to provide a few introductory remarks to give you some background about Dr. Yam. For those of you who may not know him or remember him, some of you do, I think, I hope. <clears throat> um, I worked with him for almost 40 years. Uh, we came here to Louisville together from San Diego, where I first started working in the <clears throat> Crips Clinic and Research Foundation as a dishwasher in the Jacobson Blood Research Laboratory under Crosby, William Crosby. And he had come from Boston with William Crosby uh, to set up that division. And he dragged me along with him, saved me from the streets, uh, and brought me to Louisville and uh, encouraged me to go to graduate school and so forth. But that's my story, not his story. His story starts when he was in high school and he performed poorly on a chemistry exam and his teacher told him he would never amount to anything as a chemist. So he promised himself from then on, he would become the best chemist there could possibly be. And he graduated then at the top of his class <clears throat> in chemistry. But then when he went on to medical school, his father gave him a microscope and told him he should go into medicine because medicine will provide a much better livelihood than chemistry. So that's what he did. <clears throat> and he uh, went on and did a, a internship and residency at Mount Sinai and Cook County in Chicago. And then he uh, took a fellowship at the New England Medical Center, first under William Damashek and then under uh, Bill Crosby. And uh, he had already established himself as a quite uh, talented cytologist, and he had already ha always had an interest. He promised that he would devote his life to using that microscope to the best of his and the best of its abilities. And he stuck with that for his entire career. <clears throat> so he was recognized as quite talented, so he was placed in charge of the cytology laboratory, having to read uh, all of the bone marrows at the New England Medical Center, plus the animal specimens from researchers that bring to him. <clears throat> and he realized at that time that, you know, morphology is just not enough. As good as you are, morphology is not enough. And uh, so in those early days, he, he was given permission to try to look for some kind of markers because that was a whole new concept. It was going against the grain. He thought, if you could not tell a lymphocyte in a microscope, then you are not worthy of your salt, he would say. <clears throat> but Crosby let him, let him do this. And uh, his, his reputation uh, allowed him to become invited into the Lukes as a consultant to Robert Lukes at a time of transition from the Rappaport classification system to the Lukes classification system taking on the functional characteristics as well as morphology. So he was, he was proud of that, uh, that appointment. Um, so he's, during this process, he developed a number of cytochemical markers at that time, which were available. He went through dozens and dozens of them with his colleagues and fellows and residents and developed a few of them and refined them for use as uh, cell markers in hematology. And, he went on to get a citation classic for his paper on esterases in monocytes and granulocytes, and also a New England Journal publication where he established the tartrate resistant acid phosphatase as the diagnostic marker for hairy cell leukemia. And these accomplishments then also allowed him to become consultant to the uh, French American British group for classification of acute leukemias. And those techniques, I don't know if they're still used today, but they were used for a long, long time as far as that, that classification system. So those were some of his uh, 
his heyday, um, all this time, he had stayed committed to promoting, uh, you know, clinical cytology of serous effusions and fine needle aspirate uh, all up until the, the day he retired. He was collecting those specimens and examining them and, and uh, encouraging the pathologist to take a different look at things besides the uh, Papanicolo stain. <clears throat> and I think that has uh, borne a lot of fruit these days. But more important than these uh, scientific and medical uh, accomplishments, I think this uh, lectureship really is uh, to his memory with regard to his <clears throat> talents as a teacher and mentor. That is where he really sh uh, shined. He never really was felt comfortable in an auditorium with a large audience giving a lecture, but he was really at his best uh, at the bedside with a group of students and residents and fellows, um, and also one-on-one -on -one with colleagues and, and anyone who willing to listen and to learn across from a two-headed microscope. To the day he died, he was looking in the microscope. <clears throat> Uh, the only thing that he really would brag about himself about was his abilities as a hemopsychiatrist. <laughs> he gave himself that name. Uh, he, uh, he always had his door wide open and a, a coffee can full of cookies ready to counsel and advise anybody who would come in and want to uh, get his advice about development and survival in academic medicine. And that is where uh, his mark has been made here locally. <clears throat> and also, you know, internationally, and particularly back in his, his uh, area of, in Taiwan. So I want to thank Dr. Miller and the Brown Cancer Center for uh, agreeing to sponsor this uh, lectureship. And I want to thank Dr. Kruger for giving me this chance and Dr. Tse for inviting me to provide a few uh, comments on background. Thank you. Thank you, Mop Head. He would say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, now I'm going to introduce Dr. William C. only briefly because he's going to introduce your guest speaker, Dr. Gong. Dr. C., uh, I got to help interview him to bring him here now five and a half years ago. And, you know, he left a minute ago just to take a patient phone call. So the one thing I'm going to say about Dr. C. Uh, is bone marrow transplant unit has an exercise station. Y'all have been up there and seen that. He involves the holistic approach to cancer therapy. He involves dietitians in the care of these patients. And to me, he's really opened up uh, the bone marrow transplant unit uh, in a way that others have not before him. And I wanna thank him very much for, for all of that. And then let you come on up, William, and introduce your speaker. Thank you, Dr. Kruger, for your very kind introduction. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's Lung Yam Memorial Lecture speaker, Dr. Gerald Gan, Professor of Pathology, Director of Hematopathology and Flow Cytometry Laboratory, at, uh, Medical Director of Genomic Pathology at Sydney Kimmel Medical College, Thomas Jefferson University Hospitals. Dr. Gan received his medical degree from Fudan University School of Medicine in Shanghai, China, and Master of Science from University of Louisiana at Monroe. Then he went on to receive pathology residency training at North Shore Long Island Jewish Healthcare System at New York, where we were co-residents together. Um, after that, um, he went on to receive um, hematopathology fellowship at Cornell University and molecular pathology at NYU Medical Centers. After finished training, he received, uh, he served as assistant professor and later promoted to associate professor of pathology at Duke University School of Medicine before he was appointed to his current positions. Dr. Gan is very well published and well known in his field. And his talk today will focus on his team's recent discovery 
that BCLW is a new therapeutic target for Hodgkin's lymphoma. Please join me to welcome Dr. Gan to share his exciting new finding with us. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Say, um, for inviting me uh, for this um, great lecture series. Um, it's an honor to be here. And um, when Dr. Say uh, invited me um, back uh, last year and talked to me about this lecture, um, discussed about uh, Dr. Yen's achievement, I uh, did feel a connection uh, with, with Dr. Yen. Um, he, apparently he is not only a great uh, clinical physician, but also a great pathologist as well. So, um, and um, when I uh, look into Dr. Yen's achievement, as Tony just uh, introduced, um, he was the first one who described uh, the tartrate resistant acid phosphatase uh, isoenzyme in hairy cell leukemia. But then it was not called hairy cell leukemia, it was called something that nobody understand. And then uh, I think uh, Dr. Yen is the one who worked with his colleague to rename it hairy cell, which is a great name, and uh, uh, because the, the cells look like hairy. Um, and uh, later on, uh, because by, by then, the, the test was, can only be done on so-called um, uh, um, uh, the uh, cytochemical staining rather than immunohistochemistry. So, um, but that's a tedious stand and that cannot be applied for uh, fixed tissue. And later on, when the immunochemistry is available, he is again the first one to uh, publish the, the study by immunochemistry on TRAP stand, which was published in 1996 in American Journal of Clinical Pathology. And um, later on, the, another marker, BROF, was discovered in hairy cell. BROF is mutated in almost all the hairy cell. And the, the immuno stands also developed to target on that mutated BRAF, which is kind of specific for hairy cell. And we um, had the opportunity to work on that uh, antibody and uh, studied the expression on hairy cell. And we also published uh, first um, in the nation uh, uh, of the of our results, uh, again the same journal, American Journal of Clinical Pathology, in 2015. So I did, did feel connection between us and uh, Dr. Yen. A few words about the Thomas Jefferson University, um, established uh, in 1925, uh, almost as old as Louisville, but not as old as Louisville, I guess. Um, and we uh, admit 250 students per year, and. Um, Jefferson Health has 14 hospital system and now um, uh, has two NCI cancer uh, center, Sydney Chemo Cancer Center of Jefferson. And recently we also acquired Fox Chase Cancer Center. Uh, so we've become the biggest uh, cancer service in Philadelphia area. Uh, perhaps, perhaps the most well known for Jefferson is this picture that I believe most of you have been seeing this before. The girls clinic, which painted by um, Thomas Eakins um, in 1975. Uh, the picture shows that uh, Dr. Samuel Gross performing a surgery at Jefferson Medical College. Um, and uh, you know, Samuel um, Gross was also, had also tied with Louisville. Before he joined um, Philadelphia, he was actually a, a faculty member here at Louisville. So, Again, we had the, I think he served 14 years here as chief of surgery and pathology, I believe. So uh, it was a good connection here. So. All right, um, I'm going to talk about our uh, studies, uh, recent studies in the uh, BCLW in lymphoma. And uh, uh, this is all being studied in recent two, three years. and. Uh, some of them published, others are still ongoing. So as you know, uh, BCL2 family uh, is a group of protein that uh, the function is to control cell growth and uh, cell death. Uh, this family uh, consists of two major uh, big groups, uh, the pro-survival group, 
that involve uh, include five markers, five proteins, BCL2, BCL6, uh, BCLW, MCL1, and A1. Um, and the, the other proteins are so-called pro-DAS proteins, uh, BAX, BAC and BAC, uh, others. Uh, I don't know how they give this name, but <laughs> um, so there are the rest of proteins are uh, pro uh, pro death proteins, and there's a delicate balance between those two group proteins to control the cell death and cell uh, proliferation. The, there's a, a, a great homologue or uh, conserve, conservation conserved in the protein structure of all these proteins. They, uh, most of them have three domains called BH1, BH2, and BH3. Um, and um, they are highly conserved. So they are probably from, uh, arise from same, uh, same gene uh, when they start. And the other genes, uh, the smaller proteins, are the uh, so-called BH3 proteins. And those proteins has only BH3 domain. That's much smaller. Um, and uh, it's important for those uh, from therapeutic aspect also, because many of the BCL2 family inhibitor are uh, mimic of those proteins uh, that can target on the BCL2 uh, pathway. Um, so the BCL2 family members work together to control cell death and cell proliferation. And they, um, they actually uh, bind each other from oligomers uh, to function. Usually when the, the cells receive certain stimuli that trigger the, the cell death or cell growth, the, the first proteins are get activated are the so-called initiators. And those are the small proteins of BCA, B, uh, BH3 protein, only proteins. Uh, the BH3 only proteins, the initiators, uh, can either promote the effectors, which are BAC, BAC and BAC, um, or inhibit the anti-apoplotic proteins, the BCL2, uh, the six pro uh, five pro-survival proteins. Um, so there are two, two uh, pathways and to promote uh, apoptosis. It, it can inhibit the um, anti-apoptotic proteins, then in turn, they, they suppress, they, because the, those proteins suppress the effectors. That's why the overall uh, uh, effect is to promote, to upregulate the effectors uh, by do, both pathways. Then the, the three effectors are, are mitochondria bound. And when it gets uh, 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 upregulated, up it releases the proteins, which various proteins from mitochondria, including caspase 3 proteins, which in turn promote apoptosis. So BCL2 is the first protein that being discovered um, in, in, the, in, the, in this group. Um, uh, Dr. Sandy Kosmeyer is one of the three group that discovered BCL2 protein. And uh, this was discovered in follicular lymphoma uh, uh, by a translocation. So the translocation was first found in follicular lymphoma, it was cloned and found it was a BCL2 that was translocated with immunoglobulin heavy changing. And um, <clears throat> later on this protein was um, uh, was was uh, found that it is has function of uh, pro promote survival and its main mechanism in follicular lymphoma uh, development. Um, BCLW uh, was discovered after uh, BCL2 and the BCL6 uh, X. Um, it has, again, ho highly homologous to BCL2 and BCL6. Um, when it first discovered, uh, the, it was studied in um, knockout and transgenic mice. Um, and when you knock out BCLW, what's really affected are um, only spermatogenesis. Uh, in those mice, those mice don't, didn't grow uh, sperm. But otherwise, the BCL, other organism, other, um, other organs, for example, the hematopoietic system, they actually grow properly. So the interest on the BCLW by then on the hematopoietic 
uh, cells are not high because they believe it's probably not something to do with hematopoiesis. <clears throat> um, so later on, the um, only recently the, there's evidence suggests that BCL2 um, may be um, regulated by MYC and they may be had a function in myeloid leukemia um, and in solid tumor as well. And enforced expression BCLW um, may um, render the lymphoid cells um, or special myeloid cells refractory to cytotoxic conditions. Um, so because that recent um, information that we decided to study BCLW on um, especially lymphomas, So the question we want to address is that, um, first, how does BCLW express in lymphoma, um, both at RNA and, and protein level? And um, how do RNA and protein correlate with each other? So in other words, if RNA is expressed, does protein is also expressed? Um, and the second thing is that is there abnormality at the genomic level, at the DNA level, uh, upregulation in DNA, how they is it amplified or translocated, which result in upregulation? Up um, and then uh, how does BCL2 regulate it? Is it through MYC or P P53 or something else? And lastly, is there therapeutic replication in lymphoma by targeting BCLW? So the steps is to first look at published uh, data um, to see um, the published uh, available information that whether we can find that that BCLW expression on the lymphomas. And then we will work our own cohort. We want to pull our own uh, patient samples to review the RNA and, and protein uh, expression. And, and then we want to look at the pathways in the cell line and in mice model to see how they regulate it. Um, and then look at genomic levels, uh, at DNA level, is it upregulation, DNA level? Lastly, targeting the BCLW. So first of all, we looked into um, the published information on the BCLW expression. And um, we uh, pull out, uh, most of those are actually matrix expression uh, information. Uh, it's available in public, uh, mostly from omnibus uh, public data, and some also from individual publication. We pull them together. and. Uh, we normalize them uh, each, to each other so they can be compared to each other. And here, the, the five box here represent, let me see, uh, the expression uh, of BCLW and BCL2 and BCLX, MCL1A1 in various lymphomas, um, in, um, again, uh, available data here in RNA expression. So the, the column here is the normal Berkeley lymphoma diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, marginal uh, lymphoma, mental cell lymphoma, and Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, there are several things that tells us. First of all, uh, if you look at BCLW, as compared to normal, they appear to express in universally in all lymphomas. They are, they are statistically significant. Um, the Berkeley lymphoma is slightly lower, but others uh, seem similar. Um, second, BCL2 and BCLX also had similar kind of expression pattern in across all the lymphomas. But um, MCL1 and A1 appears to have no difference between normal cell. So those three protein appears to be more universally expressed in lymphomas as compared to the other two proteins. Um, and the Berkeley lymphoma in BCL2 is very low. Uh, that's it, that's been known. So um, looks like not all the all three uh, proteins are expressing all lymphoma. Some lymphoma may select protein, express two or two proteins, some maybe three proteins. And then next, knowing that information, we want to look at own, our own cohort or own patient samples to check not only RNA, but also protein expression. So we uh, collected a, a series of samples from our patient sample. Uh, the normals, follicular lymphomas, marginal zone, mental cell, Burkitt, diffuse large piece of lymphoma, and classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Total of 121 samples. Uh, first, we validated uh, immunochemistry 
on the paraffin tissue, um, the BCLW, because it's not available uh, commercially. So we uh, uh, got several proteins from several vendors and we select the best, best one. And uh, uh, we determine the scoring system here um, by evaluating the, and uh, the negative control here, you can see that the, the, the kidney tissue, here's a glomerulus in kidney, which does not express BCLW. So that serves as negative control. And we determine the degree of expression as one and two, three. Uh, this is also comparable with BCL2 expression. And then we uh, individually look at each type of lymphoma, how the RNA and DNA expressed uh, of BCLW. Uh, in the first, we look at the diffuse large BCL lymphoma. Uh, as you can see, that uh, BCLW and BCL2 on protein level both are uh, expressed almost in a similar uh, uh, fashion, uh, averaging two plus. Here's the example of uh, the immunostain. And um, in RNA level as well, the, um, uh, the BCLW is also uh, expressed as compared to normal. So um, again, this column represents uh, tumor versus normal on RNA. Um, you can see that um, both BCLW and BCL2 are expressed uh, in the uh, diffuse large BCL lymphoma. And then um, next, we look at uh, another aggressive lymphoma, Burkitt lymphoma. Um, on the same, on the same uh, 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 expression. Uh, as you can see that in, uh, in Burkitt's, on the RNA level, BCLW is highly expressed as compared to normal, but BCL2 is, is not expressed. So this is a well known that Burkitt lymphoma do not express BCL2. And so it looks like maybe BCLW uh, uh, plays a more important role in cell survival in, in uh, Burkitt. And um, this is just showing the same thing that uh, BCLW is highly expressed. And uh, this represents each individual case, uh, cell, uh, individual uh, case. Yeah. Um, so as in the protein level that uh, it has same expression pattern as RNA, the BCLW is highly expressed, but not BCL2. And, and then we look at the, on the cell lines, uh, how uh, BCLW express in the three, we have cell, three cell lines of diffuse large BCL lymphoma and three cell lines of Burkitt lymphoma. And we look at our, uh, protein expression by Western blood because the tissue, you, you really cannot do Western. So uh, we look at, we uh, collect three cell lines each and review the uh, BCLW expression by Western blood. And again, showing same results, they are uh, highly expressed in Burkitt's cell line and the diffuse large BCL lymphoma cell line as compared to the normal spleen and normal B cell, which has no expression. So these are the two aggressive lymphoma. We then look at three uh, more like small cell lymphomas, um, namely follicular lymphoma, mental cell, and the marginal zone to see how they express. Um, so the similar kind of results uh, are uh, observed from also the three small cell type of lymphoma. And uh, again, BCLW is, uh, looks like highly expressed in follicular, uh, so as BCL2. Um, and when you look at the low, low, uh, low grade, low, uh, the grading of follicular lymphoma, low grade versus high grade here. And uh, the, in the low grade, uh, and high grade, the BCLW expression is uh, consistent, but uh, the BCL2 is higher in low grade and lower in, uh, in high grade. That is also well known that in follicular lymphoma, the, the high grade follicular lymphoma tend to have less frequency in BCL2 expression as, as compared to low grade follicular lymphoma, but their BCLW expression is pretty consistent um, throughout. Um, Kind of similar results also obtained from the protein, uh, uh, protein data that the BCLW is expressed. So um, on the other two small cell lymphoma, the mental cell lymphoma and uh, uh, marginal lymphoma, again, similar results um, as, as the other aggressive lymphoma, both BCL2 and BCLW are expressed in, in those two lymphomas. 
So uh, lastly, we also reviewed the uh, BCRW expression on the Hodgkin's. So Hodgkin's is a Hodgkin lymphoma is, is kind of a little different from other um, B cell lymphoma, non Hodgkin's, uh, in the sense that they're, they're, uh, they have uh, their tumor cells are in minority and they are more background reactive cells. Um, so it's a harder study uh, in Hodgkin's. But advantage of immunochemistry is that you can visualize each individual cells to see which cell actually express BCLW. So, uh, so in that in that sense, that we did observe a high expression of BCLW in the Hodgkin cells, which those are bigger cells, the Hodgkin cells, as compared to BCL2, uh, universal lack of BCL2 expression in Hodgkin, Hodgkin lymphoma. And here showing you that. Um, how the five protein, pro-survival proteins express, expressing Hodgkin lymphomas. Um, we pick up the, the, the highest expressed, uh, each bar represent each case here. And uh, the red color represent the highest expression level, uh, 75 percentile. And then the, the blue is perhaps the, the lower one, then the yellow is lower. So um, when you look at the Hodgkin lymphoma with the highest expression of BCLW, when you compare it to other type of proteins, you see that it looks like most of the time only BCLW is expressed. Uh, many of the uh, cases that do not express the other four uh, proteins. So that indicates that in Hodgkin's, maybe BCLW plays more important roles in cell survival, Hodgkin's cell survival, as compared to other pro survival proteins. And then we correlate with um, protein and uh, we look at correlation between protein and RNA in this various type of lymphomas. Uh, uh, zero, this is a correlation uh, analysis and one represents uh, closely correlated and zero represents not correlated. And you can see that in BCLW and BCL2, especially in Hodgkin's and mental cell lymphoma, they are the RNA and proteins are closely, closely correlated. That means if RNA expressed, protein is also expressed. So um, to summarize the, uh, that section of the, of the study, that uh, we found that BCLW is expressed in variable intensity in all, all types of lymphoma study, uh, with more consistent expression in Burkitt lymphoma and Hodgkin lymphoma. And BCL2, this is just known data, but we confirmed again that BCL2 is expressed in follicular lymphoma, mental cell lymphoma, and variable expressed DLBCL, marginal lone lymphoma. But BCL2 is very low in uh, Burkitt lymphoma and Hodgkin lymphoma. So um, because Burkitt lymphoma and Hodgkin lymphoma express very high, kind of high BCL2, uh, BCLW, but not BCL2, maybe those two uh, type of lymphoma is a good model to study BCLW. So we decided to study further BCLW on on these two type of lymphoma. And um, the question we want to answer, uh, uh, asking is that, uh, what is the role of BCLW in regulate apoptosis through MYC and G53, and maybe, maybe even microRNAs? And how does BCLW upregulate in Hodgkin lymphoma? And what is the therapeutic implication of BCLW in Hodgkin lymphoma? So first, we, um, we use a, a Burkitt lymphoma as a model to study the, uh, uh, how does uh, the BCW is regulated by MYC, because as you know that uh, MYC is, is, is consistently overexpressed in Burkitt lymphoma through a translocation with immunoglobin heavy chain uh, or light chain, but mostly heavy chain uh, with the translocation here. And um, MYC is the most, uh, one of the fast growing tumor. And um, the K67 is a measure of the proliferation and in Burkitt lymphoma, uh, it's usually 100% uh, proliferation. And, and, and also the MYC is highly expressed because of this translocation in, in Burkitt lymphoma. 
So um, CMIC has many uh, functions. Uh, one of the uh, two of the functions are cell cycle and apoptosis. And um, in the cell cycle, CMIC uh, regulate uh, cell cycle through many other proteins. Uh, one of them are P53 and cycling uh, system. So we want to look at P53 in, um, in, in association with, with, uh, with uh, BCRW expression. And the other function, uh, MOPIC also promote apoptosis, again, through a bunch of proteins, but also uh, through P53 and uh, CHAP and FAST and FAST ligand. And other, other functions of MIC is adhesion, um, differentiation, and metabolism. But our focus is uh, how does MIC regulate cell cycle and apoptosis in association with BCLW. So um, first of all, we, uh, we looked into the cell lines, we, the three MIC, uh, the Berkeley lymphoma cell line. We use a um, so-called shRNA, which is a, uh, is a small helix RNA, where you introduce through a vector, usually a virus, into the cell lines. It can suppress the target protein expression. So you want to see when you suppress BCLW, how does it affect cell growth? So we look at um, this, that uh, when these small molecules are introduced into the cell, uh, in the 96 hour, the BCLW is suppressed. Uh, the expression is very little here. And uh, then we look at uh, the uh, cell proliferation through a so-called MST uh, system, uh, assay, and also uh, apoptosis through annexin-5 assay. And uh, this line represents the uh, suppression of the, uh, the, the, the target of the uh, uh, HSRNA on BCLW. The other two lines, or three lines, represent control. So if you see, like when the BCLW is suppressed, their growth is being suppressed in those all three cells. And then when the when we silence BCLW, their apoptosis is is increased. So cell death is is increased by annexin five. This this line here represents cell death. So it's dramatically increased cell death. And then uh, we also want to, then we want to look at uh, what is, this is in vitro data, how about in vivo, uh, how about in mice model? Um, so we obtained the uh, BCLW knockout mice, uh, and uh, we have two types of mice here. One is complete silence of BCLW, they are both alleles are knocked out, and then homozygous uh, knockout, and there is a heterozygous, one allele still retained, but second allele is, is knockout. And as compared to the normal mice. Um, here again, showing the BCLW uh, expression in the heterozygous and homozygous knockout mice here. So um, then we look at the same thing, we look at cell growth and, and cell death. And in the, in the knockout mice, uh, similar results is seen in the normal cells, in pre-B cells. Um, and uh, you can see that when the, both BCLWs knock out, their cell growth is much lower as compared to heterozygous and normal mice. And their cell number count is also much lower and their viability is also reduced. So uh, not only it's in vitro, but also in vivo that when you knock out BCLW, your cell growth is reduced. Um, then we want to look at how MIC regulate uh, BCLW. So in order to do that, we obtain the MIC transgenic mice. So in the MIC transgenic mice, the, the MIC is consistently overexpressed in, in this mice. And um, when MIC overexpressed, we want to see how that affects BCLW in the uh, control of cell growth. So um, first of all, we, uh, we compare the, all the protein expression uh, in the transgenic mice in the, uh, as compared to normal mice. We first of all prove that whether BCLW is expressed. So in the transgenic mice, when mix over, always overexpressed, the BCLW and BCL2 and BCLX is suppressed. So that's showing that in those, if mix overexpressed, they kind of suppress the three uh, pro-survival protein here. But not, there's no effect on the other protein, MCL1.
And, um, and then um, how does it affect the BCLW? So we cross-match, cross-mate the, the mixed transgenic mice with BCLW deficient uh, mice. And we generate several group of litimate uh, with uh, uh, offspring here. So um, one is, uh, again, uh, BCLW heterogeneous, deleted mice, and one is complete deleted mice in the mixed transgenic uh, strain. So um, by doing that, you can see that there's a more dramatic effect in affecting the, the cell growth and cell death. As you remember in the previous uh, experiment with only BCLW knockout, as compared to when you add MIC on it, when MIC overexpress, the, uh, the, the cell growth is essentially flat. There's no cell growth uh, in BCLW double knockout situation. And the uh, viability is dramatically reduced over the time and uh, the apoptosis is uh, increased dramatically. So MIC has more dramatic effect on the uh, cell growth and, and the cell death when MIC is involved. Um, and then, as you know, that uh, uh, in mixed transgenic mice, eventually they all, they all grow in four months. Uh, if you give it time, they grow out, all the mice grow in four months. So when they grow in four months, they are sacrificed. And we want to see that with the add of BCLW, uh, when we, when we move, remove BCLW, how does that affect the lymphoma growth? Okay. So um, when the BCLW is intact, the, the, those mice in the day, almost like day 200, almost all of them grow lymphoma. So, um, but when you knock out BCLW, uh, this line here, as you can see that the mice survive much longer and the, they delay lymphoma growth. And, and by uh, almost like a half time, um, in day 400, they start to, 300 start to grow some lymphomas and by day 500, they uh, all grow lymphoma. So, Knockout BCLW tremendously delay the, the lymphoma growth in mice, which from the other end, you can think about the BCLW is important to promote lymphoma growth in, uh, when mixed uh, upregulated. Okay, I think my time is not very good. So I need to move into, uh, I'm gonna skip all this and move into the Hodgkin's. Okay, so. All right, so um, the Hodgkin lymphoma is the second lymphoma that we want to look. Uh, one reason is because Hodgkin lymphoma uh, has overexpressed BCLW, but very low BCL2. Second reason is that the pathogenesis of Hodgkin lymphoma is largely unknown. Uh, the reason is because, uh, one of the reasons is because the, in, in Hodgkin lymphoma, the, the lymphoma cells are minority and uh, majority are background cells. So that's why it's very hard to study Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, as you know, Hodgkin lymphoma was described uh, almost 200 years ago by uh, Thomas Hodgkin. And then after 100 years, uh, when we have the histo sections, uh, Dr. Dorothy Reed recognized that uh, under the microscope, those large cells are the tumor cells and those background cells are not tumor cells. So these are named Riesenberg cells in Hodgkin after Dr. Dorothy Reed and uh, Dr. Sternberg. And um, the cell origin of Hodgkin lymphoma was uh, not known for many years until 1994 that um, uh, using a micro dissection technology, um, Dr. Cooper cut the, each individual Hodgkin cells and he did a uh, immunoglobin heavy chain gene re re rearrangement on each individual Hodgkin cell and compare with the surrounding normal cell. And then he did the uh, IgH rearrangement. He found that all the Hodgkin cells have same IgH rearrangement, while the surrounding normal cells has different rearrangement. So uh, by showing that, he showed that Hodgkin lymphoma is actually also B cell origin, uh, despite they don't express B cell markers. Um, that's why it's not recognized as B cell, but by doing genomic study that individual cell genomic study, he proved that Hodgkin lymphoma is indeed a B, also B cell lymphoma. 
Uh, there are four kinds of Hodgkin lymphoma uh, by histology, nodular sclerosis, mixed cell rarity, lymphocyte rich, lymphocyte depleted, but they are all, clinically they're all same. They're just pathologic classification, which uh, based on purely morphology. Um, we start, we pulled out about 48 of, uh, Hodgkin lymphomas. We did the same thing. We did the uh, RNA and, and the protein analysis. And also, um, we also look at a DNA level uh, on, the, on these Hodgkin lymphomas. So uh, first of all, again, we did the same thing. We pulled out the, um, the published uh, expression data uh, from published data, RNA expression. As you can see that um, in the BCLW and BCL2, BCLX, these three pro survival proteins, the uh, BCLW is over, I mean, sorry, only in BCLW and BCLX, the, uh, it's overexpressed as compared to normal, but BCL2 is not overexpressed. And also, um, I'm gonna go to the next one to show you. Um, also, there appears to be a positive correlation between uh, BCLW and BCLX uh, and the negative correlation between BCLW and BCL2. Now here showing each individual case here, uh, the red means overexpressed and the blue means underexpressed. And then we compare this with the BCLX and BCL2. And you can see that when BCLW is overexpressed and <laughs> Many of the cases also overexpress BCLX. So that's also showing this graph here, and they usually uh, express both proteins at the same time. However, BCL2 looks like they're almost all of them are underexpressed. So in Hodgkin lymphoma, Hodgkin lymphoma survival may be regulated by, more importantly, by BCLW and BCLX, but not by BCL2. And then we look at the, um, the BCLW expression, uh, BCL2L2 is BCLW. So BCLW is written based on the clinical information. We look at clinical stage, okay, one, two, three, four. And we look at the diagnostic, early relapse in the refractory cases. We also look at IPS score. Uh, we divide them out to look at BCLW expression. So it looks like the higher stage of the uh, disease the higher level of BCLW expression. And also, um, in the, uh, as compared to diagnostic material uh, time, when there's a relapse in the refractory uh, cases, they have a higher expression level as compared to the diagnostic cases. And then we look at IPS score, the, the higher IPS score, when it's, it's uh, between three to seven, as compared to less than three, it has also higher expression of, of BCLW. So the more aggressive lymphoma appears to express more BCLW. Skip that. Um, okay, so uh, this is the data for B protein. Um, so we proved that uh, on the protein level that the BCLW is highly expressed in Hodgkin's. Then we look, want to look at a DNA level, how these are, these are expressed. Are they due to amplification DNA or this due to translocations? So we, we use a fish study, so called fluorescent insectual hybridization that look for the DNA copy of this gene. And we use two uh, different uh, probes which target on BCLW region. Okay. One probe with the centromere control, one probe without centromere control for fish analysis. And uh, we found that in Hodgkin lymphoma cells, um, they, they are always more than two copies. So that's, that's known that in Hodgkin lymphoma, they are usually so-called polysomy. They have more than 48 sets of chromatin. But in addition to that, there are also extra signal of BCLW. BCLW is red color. The central mirror control is green color. In addition to, in this case, three copies of chromatin 14, but there's also extra copy of BCLW. So uh, as compared to the normal cells, those are the normal cells, smaller uh, surrounding cells, they all have two sets of copy, like two red and two green. So this show that at the genomic level, uh, the BCLW is amplified maybe through polysomy and through 
local amplification. Um, we also look at um, the RNA expression of the uh, BCLW on the Hodgkin's as compared to the protein expression. And uh, uh, we select so-called syncytial variant um, uh, cases because, because Hodgkin cells are minority. When you look at RNA expression, you look at all the cells. So maybe some surrounding normal cells will affect your results, right? Unlike non Hodgkin's, they're more pure in the tumor cells. But uh, the syncytial variant Hodgkin's contains large amount of Hodgkin cells as compared to the surrounding normal cells. So that is more accurate in study RNAs um, expression. So we look at that, we have 10 cases, and we see a very nice correlation between RNA and, uh, and protein. So when uh, here is, is uh, I'm sorry, not RNA, between the DNA, DNA amplification and RNA expression. So when DNA is amplified, the, the RNA is also uh, amplified. And um, so um, as, as you know, with that data, we were thinking, can we target on um, BCRW on Hodgkin lymphoma? And we want to try that, see how it goes. So uh, as you know that in BCL2 family, there are uh, many uh, target uh, drugs have been developed. Uh, there are usually two categories. One category is the uh, oligomer, antisense DNA oligomers. The other uh, category are the uh, small molecules, so-called BH3 mimeric molecules, and the mimic BH3 protein that binds to other uh, BCL2 family and suppress its function. So um, the, the venetoclax is probably most well-known uh, BCL3 uh, mimetic uh, proteins. Uh, that ex express BCL2, and then uh, there's also a BCL6 uh, expression protein, and there is a venetoclax, which also developed earlier in the stage, that express all, uh, suppress all three protein here. So those are three proteins that we want to review. And we have three Hodgkin cell lines that we uh, obtained, and uh, we uh, look at those three Hodgkin cell lines with three uh, inhibitors. Um, so first of all, we want to look at the BCLW expression of all three cell lines. Looks like, um, and uh, they are overexpressed here. So as BCLX, but BCL2 is not overexpressed. And then we use a again small um, small RNA SHRNA to target um, to silence BCLW. And as you can see that uh, by 96 hour, the BCLW is silenced by these small RNAs, and um, they are. Uh, apoptosis is increased tremendously. Then we apply those three drugs. Uh, again, nevetoclux are the expression of BCL2 and BCL6, uh, X and WW, and venetoclax, and then BCLX inhibitor. Now, there's no BCLW inhibitor by itself, so we can do, we can compare those three and see how the effect of BCLW indirectly rather than directly. And as you can see that using the nematoclax um, treatment, it has highest expression, uh, suppression of the, of the cell, uh, cell growth as compared to the BCL2 uh, only, suppressor only, and the BCLX suppressor only, and combination of BCL2 and BCLX only. So, so indirectly that shows that maybe suppressing BCLW is more effective in Hodgkin lymphoma as compared to the suppressing other proteins. And here is the uh, apoptosis is higher, and this represent uh, cell growth and cell number. So our conclusion is that uh, BCLW, but not BCL2, is consistently overexpressed in Hodgkin lymphoma cells. Um, increased BCLW expression Hodgkin is due, at least in part, to the copy number change of, at DNA level. Um, BCLW flourish with clinical stage ITI and relapse Hodgkin lymphoma, and targeting on BCLW induced apoptosis in Hodgkin lymphoma cells. Um, so a few acknowledgments, this study is done by a collaboration between Aishin's lab and Department of Pathology. Um, Dr. Vogel did um, a protein analysis, and Dr. Liu did uh, a fish, and in Aishin's lab, um, 
Claire did mice uh, work and the RNA work, and Dr. Mitra did uh, all the informatics analysis. And our co collaborator also in Annette Kim from Tennessee, now at Howard University, and John Choi at St. Jude's Children's University. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? I guess questions? Time, time is up. But yes, we can have questions. Lights up, please. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, very good question. So, um, double healing pharma, we, we haven't looked at double healing pharma yet. Uh, that's a very really good question. But, um, Looks like a PCLW uh, expression in uh, in Burkitt is not very high. Um, it is higher than um, the others, like PCL2, but as compared to DLPCL, DLPCL actually has higher expression level uh, as compared to Burkitt. So uh, yeah, we are actually, the, the double healing lymphoma is a, another cohort that we are, uh, we are we're going to look at it. So, yeah. Yes. Um, so maybe I didn't explain clearly. In, uh, in uh, Hodgkin lymphoma, the expression of BCL2 is very, very low, and both in RNA and, and the protein level. But the expression of BCL W uh, is high in RNA and high in uh, protein. And uh, this was actually proved by looking at the syncytial variant of Hodgkin's, which are rich in Hodgkin cells. Uh, in, in those in Hodgkin lymphoma, there fewer reactive cells in background will affect the results. Uh, we look at about 10 syncytial variant Hodgkin's, which shows high expression PCLW, which is also uh, in keeping with the protein expression level, which are done by immunohistochemistry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we uh, we didn't compare with email BCL two. Um, we um, we only look at email BCLW. In email BCLW, when the BCLW is retained, the lymphoma grows much faster than the BCLW is knocked out. Um, we has emailed uh, heterogeneous heterozygous BCLW and homozygous deletion BCLW. We compare with that. Now, when you compare with uh, intact BCLW with heterozygous deleted BCLW, the, the growth of lymphoma is almost the same. They're in 200, 200 days, 150, 200 days. But when the BCLW is entirely knocked out, like completely knocked out, the lymphoma grows much slower. They much maybe about 200, 500 days when they grow lymphoma. But we haven't compared with BCL2, email BCL2 yet. So. Not at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I don't know, but you, you guys are more expert than I do. Just, uh, I think the most reason is that uh, uh, Nevaticus has a very strong toxicity in the platelets. They, they cause the thrombocytopenia. So that, you know, um, prevent that use of the drug for, uh, is that correct? And, and, yeah. do, do you anticipate yeah. a, a, a just a BCLW uh, drug come down? You mentioned that you can't just tar target that one alone. Do you anticipate that's possible? Um, well, ideally you would, you would want the want BCLW that. <laughs> alone. Um, but uh, as you look at the many lymphoma has not only expressed one protein, but also several proteins, like for, for example, Hodgkin lymphoma express BCLW and BCLX. So you, you may want a, a, a drug that can target several proteins at the same time. And that may be, of course, we can use two drugs, individual drugs, but you know, that's also useful.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jong. Um, it has been um, oh, wow. a very much a pleasure. And you don't have to swing this, but uh, <laughs> uh, a prior chair started this as, uh, as something that we uh, like for anybody that comes from a, an esteemed outside institution. We want you to also advertise for the University of Louisville <laughs> and Louisville Slugger. So uh, here you well, go, uh, your 2020 Lung T. Yam Lecture, University of Louisville on your name on it. We thank you very much. We can mail that to you if you took a plane, but you'll get in trouble. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> But I'll definitely sing around with the pandemic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.